This video is a quick summary of the final preparation that you want to do ready for the morning of GCSE Physics Paper 1 and also in the first five minutes of the exam to make you as successful as you possibly can be. By now you've already taken two GCSE Science papers so hopefully this is old news but you'll have noticed that on the front of the exam paper you're told to bring a black pen, a ruler, a protractor for physics and a scientific calculator. The black pen is because unlike your mock exams this paper isn't going to be given to one person to mark. It'll be scanned and black ink is much better at scanning than blue ink. The ruler and the protractor may be necessary for scale diagrams, although that's more of a paper two thing, but you are supposed to have them. So make sure that you've got them before you go to the exam. The scientific calculator is important because in GCC physics, 30% of the marks are for math skills. If you haven't got one, go and find your science teacher or even a member of the maths department before you go to the exam. Don't wait until you're in there because the invigilators might have a limited supply of spare equipment that they can lend out and you don't want to risk having to do the exam without it. If you haven't already, make sure that you've had a look at the mathematical requirements section of the specification. This is in chapter seven if you're doing triple science, GCSE physics, or chapter nine if you're doing combined science. This is a full list of all of the different mathematical skills that the exam board can test as part of the GCSE science papers. It's all going to be stuff that you're familiar with from GCSE Maths and that hopefully you've even practiced in science lessons. But often people are caught out because they don't think of how much maths content there are in the physics papers. And so they're then surprised when they're asked to give their answer in standard form or round to a certain number of significant figures. I'd also recommend as you go through the exam paper, doing a star next to these instructions or highlighting them or just doing something, because very often people are so focused on the scientific content that they lose out on marks for things that they can do, like rounding to the correct number of significant figures. Now, when you go into the exam, you have 75 minutes for 70 marks or 105 minutes for 100 marks if you're doing the separate science exams. So essentially you have one minute per mark, but you also have five minutes spare. So I would really recommend that you use those five minutes to get yourself in the best frame of mind and get really set up positively for the exam. It can be really helpful to walk into the exam knowing a few key facts that you're ready to write down, regardless of what's on the exam paper. This is partly because it's going to help you to remember those crucial pieces of information, but it's also because it means that instead of starting the exam feeling a little bit panicky and unsure, you're starting by feeling in control, because regardless of what the exam paper says, you're going to do the same thing. Handily, for physics, you do have a spare piece of paper on which to write these pieces of information. So you do get an equation sheet, and in 2022, this is going to be much more extensive than in previous years. But remember, that equation sheet doesn't tell you absolutely everything that you need to know. So one quite useful thing to do at the start of the exam is to annotate that equation sheet with the units for all of the various quantities. You can start off by writing down things like all of the energy quantities are measured in joules, mass is in kilograms, Speed is measured in metres per second, and both height and extension are measured in metres. It's really important that you're using the correct units, because otherwise when you complete a calculation, your answer could be out by several orders of magnitude. If you aren't super confident with rearranging, then it can also be helpful to write down the rearranged versions of these equations. Particularly, I'm thinking about more complicated ones, like this kinetic energy equation, which has a squared term. So if you feel like you're not going to be able to rearrange that under pressure in the exam, it's worth memorising that rearranged version. And then you can just write it onto your equation sheet before you get started. You'll then have some spare room on that equation sheet to write down a few key facts, either things that maybe you got wrong in the mocks and you want to make sure you got right this time, or information that is just very likely to come up. I'd recommend picking maybe five key things that you're going to write down. But I'm going to give you quite a few different ideas here because different people are going to write down different things, particularly this year when there's different topics being assessed for foundation and higher and triple and combined. The working scientifically skills are always a good place to start because they're assessed in all six science papers. So the first thing would be the variables for an investigation. Mixed dry stands for we modify the independent variable, which goes on the x axis if you're drawing a graph. And then the dependent variable is the one that you record and it goes on the y-axis. Control variables are the things that we force to stay the same between different trials in order to make the data valid. So I always remind my classes that I am a control freak. I like everything to be the same all of the time. I want the same seating plan every lesson. I always have my same lilac coloured PowerPoint. I'm a control freak. Things stay the same. 
it's a good idea to have your unit conversions written down, and these are the same for every base unit. So regardless of whether we're thinking about meters or grams or joules, there are always a thousand milli something in a something, and there are always a thousand of that something in a kilo something. The only exception to this is if you're thinking about centimetres, because centimetres aren't a proper scientific unit. So there are 100 centimetres in a metre, but every single other conversion that you need to do is by a thousand or by a thousand and then a thousand again. You might want to remind yourself that when you're describing relationships, two quantities are directly proportional if when you double one, you double the other. So it's not enough to say that they both increase at the same time. That would just be positive correlation. To be directly proportional, it needs to be doubling and doubling. You could also describe how if you plot them on a graph, it's not just a linear graph, but a linear graph that passes through the origin. So through that zero, zero point. Finally, you might want to remember that a systematic error is one where your readings are always out by the same amount in the same direction every time. So say if you have a thermometer that always gives you a temperature that's one degree lower than it should be. And so once you know that, you can just add a degree onto all of your readings. Whereas a random error is where you've got natural variation around the mean. So you adjust for this by collecting a lot of data and calculating a mean then you might choose to have some key facts written down that actually relate to the physics in this paper. So there are four topics, energy, electricity, the particle model of matter and atomic structure and radiation. Now, a lot of these don't really have very complicated facts that you're likely to forget. I think the energy topic in particular is a lot of calculations and, and not so much factual recall. But even so, there may be particular things that you think, oh, I'm going to forget that in the exam. So it's better to have it ready to scribble down right at the start. So we start off in energy with stores and transfers. So you might just want a little reminder um, that your stores are mechanically stored, kinetically stored, thermally stored, gravitational potential energy, chemical, um, elastic potential, electrostatic and nuclear. And then your transfers are going to be transferring mechanically, um, electrically, by radiation and by heating. You might want to have something in there about um, different ways of generating electricity and their advantages and disadvantages, because this could come up as a nice six marker evaluate question. So advantages are going to be things like, oh, solar energy is renewable, but then um, burning fossil fuels is much more reliable because it works even when it's not sunny and even at night. Um, but using um, wind turbines, they don't release carbon dioxide, which is obviously an issue for greenhouse gases and um, global warming. But then if I think about um, nuclear power, that's a really energy dense fuel. So a very small amount of uranium will allow me to generate a huge amount of electricity. And then most of your disadvantages are just this power source doesn't have that advantage. Um, but also there are things in there like if you're talking about nuclear power, you need to worry about how to dispose of the radioactive waste. And there's obviously a risk of nuclear accidents and for things like wind turbines. We can talk about them being eyesores. And so people don't really want them near their houses. Now, you might have some things that you're going to write down that are personal to you. So um, one that I think is not a hard fact to remember, but that has thrown a lot of people before are your symbols for a resistor and a fuse, because what people do is they draw the wires for the circuit and then they draw the resistor on top of it. And so there's still a line going through the middle of it. And what you've actually drawn is a fuse rather than a resistor. So that's just an example of one silly mistake that might be personal to you. Um, that maybe nobody else would want to write down. But just think about things that maybe you got wrong in your mocks or that might trip you up. Um, a really common one that people struggle with is remembering which way around current and potential difference go. So this idea that um, current is the same everywhere in a series circuit, but in a parallel circuit, it splits along the branches. And then potential difference is the reverse. So in a parallel circuit, each component gets the full potential difference. But if we have two components in series, then the potential difference is split between them. And that's one reason why light bulbs in series are dimmer than in parallel. Um, you might want to jot down a quick reminder of your IV graphs for an ohmic resistor at a constant temperature. So just a wire that's been kept cold and then a filament bulb and a diode. Or a little reminder that a light dependent resistor um, resists less when it's lighter and a thermistor resists less when it's hot. For your particle model, you might just want a little reminder of the arrangement of the particles. So that idea that um, in a liquid, the particles are still all touching each other. They're just not in a nice regular pattern. Um, and obviously your state changes. So melting and boiling and freezing and condensing and also sublimating as you go straight from a solid to a gas. You might want to remind yourself that the particles in a solid vibrate in fixed positions and they have strong forces between them. 
and that the particles in a gas are in constant random motion. Um, you also might want to remind yourself that um, the temperature of a gas is going to be proportional to the amount of kinetic energy that the particles have. And then for atomic structure, you might be focusing on the different kinds of radiation. So just giving yourself a little reminder of what they all are. Thinking about the fact that alpha particles can be stopped by paper, beta particles by thin aluminium, and gamma radiation needs a thick layer of lead to stop it. Alpha radiation is the most ionising, but gamma radiation is the most penetrating. And also, I think one of the hardest things to remember is about half-life. So this idea that half-life is the time taken for either the count rate or the number of radioactive nuclei in a sample to half. And you might want to sketch yourself out a little graph just to remind yourself that if you're trying to work out half-life from a graph, what you do is find really any point on the y-axis and then work out where on the graph half of that value is. So here I started at 100 and I found 50. And then the time taken to get from 100 to 50, that's my half-life. One other thing I would recommend you do before you begin the rest of the paper is to find the six mark question. Now, you may have more than one six mark question in your paper, but there will definitely be at least one because there is always one question that is common to the foundation tier and the higher tier. So if you're sitting foundation, it'll be question five, six or seven. And if you're sitting higher tier, it'll be one, two or three because it's going to be pitched at about a grade four or five level. The reason I'd suggest finding that question nice and early is that you do get some credit for laying out your ideas in a logical fashion. So you want to have time to actually think your answer through and make sure that you are putting these ideas in a sensible order. And also because that piece of paper can be quite intimidating. So if you look at the question before you look at the rest of the paper, then as you're going through the paper, you can jot down any ideas you already have and make a little plan and it'll be kind of ticking away in the back of your brain. And so by the time that you're ready to actually answer it, you've had a little bit of thinking time and you've got some ideas and you've put them in a logical structure. So if I had a question like this, um, I'd be starting off thinking, well, what's, what is it that I'm actually trying to figure out and what's the equation that I'm going to need? So I might just scribble down at the start, here's my equation for um, calculating the amount of energy and it's got specific heat capacity within that. And then in order to use that equation, I need all the various parts. So for instance, I'm going to need to know the mass of these three blocks. So I might scribble down that I'm going to need a balance. And then I go and I work on the rest of the paper. And then at some point it occurs to me, oh, if I'm going to include temperature in there, I'm going to need to include a thermometer in my method. And then I go and I answer another question and I go, oh yeah, I need to talk about energy. So in order to work out the, um, the energy that's transferred to each of these blocks, I'm going to need to use my voltmeter and my ammeter together with a stop clock. So your voltmeter and your ammeter you use um, together to work out power and then power with time gives you energy. And then at some point I go, oh yeah, I need to actually talk about how I'm heating these blocks up. So I'm going to need to talk about having an electrical heater. And so as I'm working my way through the paper, I can be kind of going back and jotting down these ideas. And then by the time I'm actually ready to answer the question, I've got a much better idea of what I'm going to write rather than just waiting until I get to it and then going, oh, no, I've only got five minutes left and I just need to splurge, which is never a good idea. So hopefully that's given you some good ideas about how to just put yourself in a really good frame of mind ready for physics paper one. There will be a full paper summary coming for the combined science papers, um, so look out for that and good luck with all the rest of your revision.